And the stuff I'm presenting today is very different from what we've all been seeing so far uh, during this workshop, primarily because uh, my background's actually in aerospace engineering. And I'm really interested in understanding fluid motion or fluid physics at really, really small scales. Um, and so here's an example of some of you know, the imagery that we can achieve using some of the new tools that we've developed uh, at Ambari within the last two, two and a half years. Uh, so first, I want to kind of give you a reason for why we should care about these really small scale fluid motions. And that, you know, these are uh, scales that are really relevant to these individual organisms when they're, you know, trying to avoid, let's say, predation or find food. And this is an example of actually one of the uh, lab setups we had here at, at Hui when I was here for a postdoc, uh, where we uh, simulated the suction feeding flow of, let's say, a fish by using a siphon and then placed copepods in the same tank. Uh, and then what's really interesting is that these animals have the ability to detect hydrodynamic signatures. And then once they reach uh, a location with you know, a high enough signature, then that results in an escape response. And for these organisms, being able to detect these signals is extremely important because it can be the difference between life <laughs> or death. Right. <laughs> and so if we're interested in studying these kinds of interactions, right, in the natural environment where these animals reside, we have to think about how do we go about doing that and what are the tools that are actually available to us to do that. And so uh, one of the really kind of basic ways in which we can visualize fluid flows is using dive visualizations. I mean, all of you are very familiar with that on larger scales. Um, on smaller scales, you, know, you can have a scuba diver placing dye in front of an animal and that organism or that system can swim through it and you can very clearly see what these you know, fluid interactions look like. Uh, but these dive visualizations are useful, but they're not very quantitative, right? They're qualitative descriptions of what the flow is doing. And there's a technique that's been widely used uh, in the laboratory, uh, in you know, the engineering literature, also in the biomechanics literature now. It's called particle image velocity symmetry. And it's a technique that allows us to do quantitative uh, measurements of fluid motion. And Really, if I can summarize the technique, it requires really just two um, major components. The first is a you know, camera, so something that's imaging the flow. And then in order to see flow, you need to have a, a source of light, where in this case, you know, we're using a laser, and then optics located in front of the laser uh, to create or generate a light sheet. And so if you have then particles that are suspended in the water that you're trying to study or measure, and these particles happen to be uh, neutrally buoyant, you can then infer the motion of fluid from the motion of these particles. And so what results uh, is in this example, before I play it, um, on the left, those are um, going to be particle fields. So those are the raw images you collect uh, in your camera when you're using this technique. And then using uh, cross-correlation algorithms and the from the displacement of these particles over time, you can come up with velocity fields, which is what you see in the middle. And you know, each one of those vectors represent the you know, direction as well as the magnitude of that flow in a particular region. And then you can also uh, use that velocity information for a variety of other uh, calculations, like energetics, uh, performance of swimming, for example, or um, also the rotational sense of flow, right? So, which is vorticity. That's what you see on the right. So the color uh, contours, uh, blue indicates counterclockwise rotation, and red indicates clockwise rotation. And so what you can see is, you know, not only do we have, you know, we have high spatial uh, resolution of these velocity fields, but then also tempo high temporal resolution as well. So these videos were collected at 30 frames per second, you know, depending on the, the imager you use, you know, that could be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 frames per second. And so one of the challenges that, you know, we're really interested in is, so how do you study these small-scale fluid motions in situ, right? These organisms, you know, marine organisms live in really dynamic environments. And what happens in a laboratory doesn't necessarily equate to what happens, right, in the natural environment. And so what we try to do at Ambari is develop an instrument that allows us to do these particle image loss symmetry measurements uh, off an ROV. And so the um, development really started uh, with a conceptual design in uh, summer of 2014. And then in 2015, I began my postdoc that January, 
And uh, we developed, we actually had a working model uh, for DPIV uh, that summer, which is an extremely fast turnaround for any of you that do you know, tech development. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of the first use case, uh, trying to understand giant larvation ecology in Monterey Bay. And so the first version, version 1.0, really just involved deploying a laser with optics in front of a camera, the science camera, on a mini ROV. So I don't know if you're familiar, but mini ROV is actually the smallest um, uh, ROV that we use at Ambari. Uh, it can be deployed on a variety, on ship, very different ships of opportunity. Uh, and what uh, this, it's basically, you know, it's about this high, <laughs> this tall. And uh, what you'll notice is, you know, here's the science camera, and then attached to the ROV in the front is uh, a laser housing where you have a lot of optics, uh, different kinds of illumination uh, to, to try and, you know, visualize your organism without, you know, eliciting, let's say, an escape response. Um, there's also an additional camera here that allows the ROV pilot to, you know, know where the laser sheet is relative to the organism that we're trying to study. And then what you see here is uh, we call a vortex generator. And really what that is is it allows us to create empirical flows uh, that we can then compare you know, our field measurements with what kinds of measurements we get doing the same technique but in the laboratory. And so then we, we modify later the vortex generator uh, to have either a dye visualization or dye injector, and then later a particle injector, which I'll explain why that's been really useful. And so what you can see then on the right is mini ROV in the test tank in Ambari. Uh, you'll notice that the laser uh, illuminates a sheet of light in front of the, the ROV science camera and uh, is illuminating you know, the motion of bubbles, like a bubble sheet that's, uh, that we set up inside the tank. And again, this is the reason why we decided to start with mini ROV is that this vehicle is easy to use. Um, in a, you know, a constrained lab environment so we can ensure that everything was, uh, you know, calibrated prior to deployments uh, in the field. So, giant larvations. I know, noticed a couple of people had mentioned them earlier uh, during the workshop. Uh, but, you know, in this particular case, this is Bathocordia stygius. Uh, it's, a, well, we call them giant larvations because by giant, I mean they can get to body lengths up to 10 centimeters in size. Uh, their body morphology is actually relatively simple, so you have a, a trunk or a head and a tail, and these organisms are able to, you know, swim from point A to point B using rhythmic uh, tail motions. But what's really interesting about these organisms is not only do they use their tail to swim from point A to point B, they also use their tail to drive massive amounts of fluid in through their filtration structures. So these are uh, their mucus houses. Uh, they uh, can be as large as one meter in size. And what you'll notice is there's this exterior surface that surrounds the entire uh, construct, but then inside where the animal is attached to it is an inner filter. And there's, if you just look at the exterior surface, you can tell there's a lot of complexity here. And one of our challenges was, well, can we directly measure the filtration rate? So how much water is actually entering that filtration con uh, complex uh, over time. And uh, we had actually quite a bit of success. But before, oops, I want to go back because I don't want you to see this yet. Before I play this video, I want to explain kind of the process by which we get these kinds of measurements. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, so giant larvations can be found uh, pretty high abundances between 100 and 300 meter depths in Monterey Bay. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're um, guiding an ROV to an organism that's, you know, about maybe 10 centimeters uh, in length. And you're trying to position a laser sheet that's approximately one millimeter thick on an animal that's about two centimeters wide from, you know, a surface vessel that's anywhere from 200, 300 meters away. So, um, it, you know, very challenging. And we're very excited that we were able to get these kinds of measurements. Uh, and to orient you, uh, so this is, this is a cross-section of what the larvation house looks like. Uh, here is the animal's trunk, uh, here's its tail, and then everything that's lit up around the animal is basically the outline of that inner filter in, again, that two-dimensional cross-section. And so if I play this, what you'll notice is what, you, what you're seeing is naturally suspended particulate 
that is moving through the house. So when the animal's not pumping or pull, uh, moving its tail, flow is reversing. And then when the animal starts to pump, you'll notice that there is now particles entering into this tail chamber and then going uh, through the sides because the house actually splits into two separate chambers, kind of like you know, our brain morphologies. And so what we can do is we can actually use these particle measurements to then um, you know, directly estimate the filtration rates of these organisms. And so the averages that we found uh, just with the uh, Bathocordius uh, stygius as well as Bathocordius magneti, two different species of giant larvations, was the average was 40, about 45 liters per hour. Um, and the max the measurements that we actually were able to attain was a, approximately 80 liters per hour. But then if you, you, know, you compare that with what was kind of estimated before, thanks to Alice Aldridge's work, Mary Silver's work, uh, using dyes, and you know, that's something on the order of you know, 10 liters per hour, uh, we, we measured directly something much larger than that. And so what, as a fun exercise, what we wanted to do was to just see, well, then what does this mean kind of on a larger scale? And if you're familiar, you may or may not be familiar uh, with uh, Bruce Robeson's midwater uh, transect, mid transect uh, data set, where basically, I think for 22 years now, I think, they've been collecting video data uh, at, I think, at 100 meter intervals uh, every month. And then after those videos are collected, somebody is annotating you know, where organisms are at what point um, down to the genus or even species level. And so we can take all of that data and just focus on giant larvations. And what we're able to find is that you know, there's a, a maximum uh, density of these individuals uh, and an average density of these individuals. And if you use the max numbers, what's uh, pretty interesting is that uh, these animals, given these high filtration rates, have the potential or the capacity to filter 200 meter swath of you know, their, their principal depth range in about 13 days. So you can imagine there's a, this massive process of moving fluid through these filtration structures and then ultimately what the fate of those filtration structures are to wind up on the bottom of, of Monterey Bay. And so, so that's one application uh, of DPIV, right, is trying to measure fluid motions what we're able to do is then retool the dye injector on the instrument and instead inject particles. Because one of the aspects of this work was also to understand the function of these houses. Are these houses uh, like uh, passively selecting different particle size classes? And so again, we changed the, um, the, the, the mechanism on the, the, the dye injector and then switched out the, um, the material from dye to uh, microparticles that actually happen to be plastic, microplastics, from uh, 10 microns in size up to about half a millimeter. And we'd stay on the animal and watch this organism then you know, filter these particles out of uh, the water around them that enters into their house. And if you just focus on the, the microplastic that is indicated uh, before the video started playing, you can see that microplastic entering right now into the gut of that animal. And so what we found was after actually, after we made these observations, these animals ingested these microplastics, they repackaged them into fecal pellets, and it's an important a paper that was, has just been accepted in Science Advances talking about how, you know, by this is a mechanism where we could have massive transport vertically of microplastics in the ocean. But again, this study was enabled by the DPIV instrument. And then finally, because um, I have only a few more minutes, one of the other applications we found for this coherent light source for DPIV is something inspired by MRI technology where you can take you know, image scans of objects like your head or your brain and then reconstruct them into three dimensions. And we've been able to do that with the DPIV laser and what you're seeing right now is uh, a controlled scan of the DPIV instrument as it's moving through a larvation house. And so you can see over time you're moving from the anterior to the posterior end of the house. And then using those kinds of measurements we can do reconstructions where the dark gray is the animal, the light gray is the outer inner filter. And we can pretend we're a particle and go inside the house. 
And so it's pretty amazing is that each one of those chambers actually rejoin at the buccal tube that winds up attaching in the animal's mouth. And so there's so many questions we have about the function of these houses, how different morphology or different shapes of these houses affect their filtration abilities. And again, that's an open area of research. And so just to kind of let you know where we're going with this, and you know, again, this is an open discussion. I'd be very curious to hear what some applications you all might envision uh, for the, the device. Uh, but since uh, 2015, we now have a version 2.0. Uh, so instead of just, just a laser housing that then relies on the science camera for the ROV, we have a separate camera laser package that can be affixed to the manipulator on an ROV. And we've used that now on all three of uh, Ambari's ROVs. Uh, we're starting to look at benthic boundary layers and you know, how that might impact sponge feeding ecology with uh, Jim Berry. And um, actually, in two weeks, we'll be deploying a version 3.0, which is a much smaller package. And we're hoping that that will then enable you know, use of this device on a variety of different platforms, not just you know, Ambari's ROVs. And so since our first deployment to now, we've actually had 58 deployments of the instrument. Uh, all of the dives actually has resulted in useful data, so that's been really exciting. And um, you know, let's I'm gonna stop with like leaving this open for discussion maybe during the questions, is like what's next for DPIV? I've given you examples of what we're already doing now, looking at biological flows. But there are plenty of questions in terms of you know, physically ge generated or physically driven flows that we could be looking at. Uh, we're trying, I'm actually collaborating with uh, David Butterfield at NOAA and Chris Algar at Dalhousie to look at uh, constraining vent fluxes using this uh, instrument. Um, but then you know, with further miniaturization, we can then envision other payloads uh, or other uh, platforms that this payload could be attached to. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear what, what you all think. And so I have plenty of people to thank, particularly the engineers that have been on this project. Uh, Lana Sherman's the project manager. And uh, thank you again for your time. You made Debbie's day, that's for sure. Um, quick questions while we, while we switch for, for, for Connie? Yeah. What, what size particles can you visualize with the DPIV down to what size? Well, right now, so the, given the components that we're using, the arrangement that we have now, the size of the particulate that uh, we can resolve pretty well, at least for the particle fields, is on the order of 10 microns. But I'm also going to point out that the newer system is going to have a zoom camera, a zoom capability, so we can, and a scanning mirror, so we can adjust the laser sheet size. So we're hoping, and we haven't deployed it yet, but we're hoping we'll be able to achieve anywhere from, um, like, right now I think we're 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter uh, field of views, but it'll be hopefully half a meter by half a meter down to a centimeter by centimeter. So that's, that's an exciting development. <laughs> 